Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone doing? How is everyone doing? It's so nice to see everyone here. Happy Eclipse. That's honestly why I'm a little bit late here today. It was Nova's first eclipse and our neighbor came over with the glasses. She honestly didn't use them, but I did. <laughs> and so did my mom. And I, I took a look at the eclipse. It was wild. It was honestly so, it was beautiful. And it's, I don't know if anyone else has been feeling it. I was telling Quiet when I walked in, he was like, what are you talking about? Like I said, but I felt weird the last 24 hours, just a little, just a little bit different. I don't know if anyone else has been feeling that, but I felt something and I don't know what. I'm like, is it me or is it the eclipse? So please let me know if it was me <laughs> or if it's the eclipse. Because I am I am so curious. So nice to see all the members here. Thank you all so much for being here. Woo, we, we have a, a lot to digest today. Obviously, last night was the fifth, and I'm pretty sure, final episode of Quiet on Set. And, of course, I watched it. So we're going to be doing a little recap of last night's episode and it was oh welcome Finn Finn welcome to the munchies so I watched it last night and there were some revelations that I found so heartbreaking so heartbreaking especially you know we're, we'll we'll get into it but the mom and and not even really being connected with one another until the documentary and it was it was a lot to process actually because I wasn't aware of that obviously when the doc aired until you know the episode last night and so that was really heartbreaking. So we'll be watching a little bit of it together and discussing it and then we will be talking about Dan Schneider and Dan Schneider... He just keeps popping up these days, doesn't he? He really just keeps popping up. And someone came forward to me a few weeks ago, like mid-March, with her story, and it was just... I don't even know at this point if what's the worst, you know? But it definitely was pretty bad, and I was appalled by what I read. And so I spoke to this person, and she's been super kind, and she said it was okay to share her story. She's going to be remaining anonymous, so let's make sure that after we hear her story that we respect her privacy. And I know that I tweeted about her being uh, verified. And so that means this came from a verified account. Um, I also made sure I checked and saw that she was working on that show that she said she was working on. And she's, you know, a well-known actress. And so this is a verified, verified person in, in obviously the virtual realm. And then obviously I spoke to her outside of Instagram as well. And so, yeah, so we're going to be sharing her story today. And I do just want to say before going into it, let's just make sure that our community here respects her privacy. And I know it's going to be easy for people to want to guess, obviously, who, who she is. And I just encourage everybody to just listen to the story and to respect her privacy. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll go first into Quiet on Set and watch the clips that I have here and we'll, we'll discuss it. I'm very curious to hear everyone's thoughts, if they enjoyed the fifth episode. It's hard to say enjoy, right, when we're hearing these stories that are obviously extremely heartbreaking. And there were some more Dan Schneider revelations when it comes to him calling 
someone who was part of the documentary and literally, in my opinion, calling her to just get her to support him. And I don't know if anyone else noticed, but it didn't seem like Giovanni said at any point that he apologized. So he gave her a call to get her support, but then didn't apologize. And to me, this is what... (sighs) This is what I see often when it comes to these powerful individuals who have never had to encounter any type of accountability. They, I mean, I said this about Dan Schneider. He, he doesn't know what accountability is. And this is the problem when it comes to an industry like Hollywood, for example, the entertainment industry that continually financially rewards bad behavior. So when someone constantly is getting financially rewarded for bad behavior, it's very hard for them to ever think accountability is ever going to happen, to be quite honest with you. And that's why I think a lot of this work, it does start with us. It does start with the community. And, you know, we can call it community, we can call it society, we can call it human beings, whatever you want to call it. But it starts with us and how we approach bad behavior. SH, SA, all of these things. How, How are we, how are we enabling that type of behavior. And, you know, we obviously talk a lot about HR and how even bystanders that are trying to do the right thing end up getting punished for doing the right thing. It happens all the time. And that sends a message. We talked about this on Access Hollywood Was it Friday that it aired? I think the part one of my Access Hollywood episode aired Friday. And I was talking a little bit about that and the message that it sends. So when we, as children, for example, see if other children... Back when I was younger, we used to call it tantrums. So when a kid had big feelings, because obviously when you're a kid, you're starting to explore your feelings, exploring who you are in the world. You're also starting to learn boundaries. You know, the first thing that I've noticed with Nova, for example, who's a toddler, is she's now learning the word no. You know, no, no. And she'll just kind of say it to anything at this point. You know, want breakfast? No. <laughs> you know, like She's learning no. And it's very healthy. It's like part of learning your boundaries, who you are in in the world. And so when I was younger, it was called tantrums, which has a very negative inclination, honestly. It makes you feel like something bad is happening. When really now parents are starting to call it big feelings, which is when a feeling arises that is a lot. And kids don't know how to process. To be honest with you, even adults have big feelings. I have big feelings all the time. Sometimes we can even call them triggers. Those can be big feelings where something arises and we don't know fully how to process what we're feeling. And now imagine children. And I talked about this on Access Hollywood where kids were seeing Other kids have what we used to call tantrums, big feelings, and then they were seen as problematic and wouldn't work again. And the message that sent to parents and other children was don't be a human, let alone don't be a child, or you won't work again. Meanwhile, 
extremely problematic individuals, harmful individuals are getting promoted, financially rewarded, and protected. And now that sends a whole other message. Now that sends to the child the power dynamic message. So you get the message of, if I have feelings, and I feel things and I express them, I don't work again. And then when we see individuals be harmful, they get promoted, you realize that you are in a power dynamic. That person's allowed to do X, Y, and Z, and you're not allowed to react or feel anything. So there's two messages, you know, getting sent. And in this setting, it's on set. And adults already have a hard time dealing with these messages, let alone a child. Child. It's just very, this is why I say this all the time. I'm obviously not a fan of child stars. I don't think children should be working at all, just because I think that's why we have child labor laws. And this industry will find every loophole imaginable to get around those child labor laws. I heard 17 states still don't protect children within the entertainment industry when it comes to child labor laws. And there's so much work to be done. And I just, what I really don't like about the industry preying on children, essentially, is that Kids are already blending their imagination with reality. And it's one of the most magical aspects of a child that I think we get ripped out of us through the school system and through capitalism and, and, and our nine to five. But when, when kids, it hasn't happened yet. Reality and imagination are blending still. And they feel like they can create worlds almost, and they can. They really can, I, and, I, and I see Nova doing that all the time, playing pretend, you know, with her dolls and with her Daniel the Tiger <laughs> uh, little figurines. But it's something, it's so beautiful. Like, we all love, I think, the, the energetics of children because of how they blend imagination with reality. And it's something that we get told to stop doing. Reality is the real thing and be more realistic and be more rat, you know, the whole thing. And children are still in this blending period. And the industry, for example, takes advantage of that, that blend where kids aren't necessarily knowing the difference between imagination and reality. And because of that, they're able to tell children, this is pretend now. This is pretend. So if you feel uncomfortable, you just pretend you're not um, uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Oh, oh, you think this is weird? Well, let's pretend it's not weird. And then a kid can just so easily go, oh, this is pretend. This isn't real, but it is. Remember, pretend, imagination, and reality can blend together. But as adults, we're taught they're two separate things. That's not true. I personally don't believe that, and maybe that's because I'm a creative. I love blending my imagination with reality. That's what I love to do. It's what makes reality <laughs> durable or, I don't know, sustainable. Because with just being in reality is, is rough. Because what I think reality is, is the blend of everyone's imagination. And you're like stuck in everyone's imagination. But then when you're in your imagination, it's just yours. And there's something untouched about that. 
And reality is all of us having to compromise and respond to all of our imaginations being m made into reality. Hang on a second. Maybe this is the eclipse language that's going on. I, maybe the eclipse is really starting to get to me, you guys. But this is how I'm feeling. This is how. This is what's. This is what's coming out of me today. Maybe someone will find it useful. Maybe most people are watching this going, what is going on with Alexa and the eclipse? But I really do think reality is all of us having to endure each other's imagination. And it's like sharing. When, you know, when I see Nova at the park and I see a kid go mine, and then another kid go mine, that's what reality I feel like is. It's a bunch of adults going, no, mine, this is my reality. No, this is my reality. And we're like just sharing it. We need to learn to share it. And at the same time, respect the fact that we all have our individual imaginations that contribute to reality. And every time we dip into our imagination, we bring something new into reality. And it's a beautiful process. But with the industry, it exploits that. And that's, you know, when I was having all these different interviews with people going, well, when the chesty thing happened and, you know, this happened, didn't, did you feel anything? And it's like, I was taught pretend. This is pretend. This is Nicole. This isn't me. This is PCA. This isn't Pepperdine. You know, this is uh, school. This isn't Nickelodeon. And that separation can ha be exploited. It can be exploited and it happens all the time, which is why I don't like adults making money off of kids' imagination. I don't like that because it teaches children that adults approve of what aspect of their imagination is worth investing into. When I think it should be ourselves that decides what part of our imagination we invest into. So th those are just some thoughts <laughs> that I'm having today. But while watching, you know, the 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 episode five and and hearing the the recap of Giovanni, for example, talking to Dan again and him trying to exploit her reality, it, it, it just reminds me of all of these things. It reminds me of what Dan Schneider and people like him have been rewarded for doing. And they think they can just go into people's minds and start to... Do you remember that SpongeBob episode? Was it Plankton? Do you remember that SpongeBob episode where the only episode I remember of SpongeBob, to be quite honest with you, is the Plankton episode where he gets into SpongeBob's mind and he has those controls and he's like making SpongeBob like walk around and do whatever. I feel like a lot of these predators or people that are in these positions of power think they can be like plankton and just plop into your brain and start operating it. And I don't like people that think they can get into my mind and start, and start operating it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that goes for a lot of things. That goes for a lot of things, but I really, really don't like it. I really, really don't like it. So, okay, so we're gonna watch Quiet on Set, we're going to recap it a bit, and then we're going to listen to this very brave actress who came forward to me and listen to her story that's really, really not good. And then maybe we'll also watch a little bit of Chris Massey's interview with Raven Simone. I know that a lot of people wanted me to watch it and discuss it. I haven't watched it yet. So maybe we'll watch it together and we can have a conversation about it. How does that sound? And also new members. Oh, wait, I think I missed someone here. Let me just make sure. 
felt like the interview missed chances to go off what the survivors were saying. With Drake and taking accountability for his own actions that he's been uh, tried for, Gio and Leon about their feelings about Dan's response to the diversity comments. Yeah, I think when it comes to these very industry... Uh, very different, obviously, than my reaction video <laughs> right on YouTube. I think when you get these, this was something else I was talking about with uh, Access Hollywood. Was now I'm having a little bit of a hard time with the fact that the industry is making money off of the trauma that the industry has inflicted on these people. And I'll say that again. The industry is now making money off of the trauma the industry has inflicted onto these people. And when you look at it, you go, oh, okay, maybe the industry is changing. Maybe. Or maybe now they're able to control, though, the doses, essentially of how we're consuming the impact onto these people. Like, I think these networks can go, oh, it was Nickelodeon. Oh, it was Nickelodeon. Just like what I say when it comes to predators. Focusing, hyper-focusing on, on the rotten apples. And what does that do? When we zoom in and hyper-focus on a specific detail of something, we're going to miss the bigger picture. And so the industry is so quick now to go, oh, it was Nickelodeon. Or let's say with the Me Too movement, oh, it was Harvey Weinstein. It was this, it was that, it was this. It's, it's, it's the entire industry. The enti and also, not just the entertainment industry, this is happening in all industries. This is capitalism, the eye of the predator. Wherever you can follow capitalism, you're gonna see the same type of behavior because it's based off of exploiting human life. And honestly, anything, the earth, the air, water, anything they can exploit. They'll do it. And predatory behavior, SA, these things are just one specific detail on how predatory behavior behaves. Equality. Behavior of predators. But really what predatory behavior is, is exploitation. It's power and control. That's what it is. Just power and control over and over and over again. And so even when we just focus on Dan or we focus on Nickelodeon, we're, it's important to expose these things because hopefully that leads to us being able to look at all the other industries that are doing the exact same thing. And obviously when it comes to the entertainment industry, this is a privileged situation with capitalism. This is what it looks like in a privileged situation. That's not what it's doing to the whole world. Not even close. It's so much worse than that. So much worse than quiet on set. And it's not about comparing. It's just that it, it's dense predatory behavior. Like eat predators is about eating predatory behavior. And that doesn't mean just SA. That also means eating the predatory behavior that we have inherited through existing in this reality, <laughs> this shared existence. When you have a negative thought about yourself, what do you think that is? As a part of yourself preying on what it considers the weak side of you. So it's internalized predatory behavior. We all carry predatory behavior. It's about how far individuals will go with it. And we have to be mindful about it even when it comes to ourselves. Even when it comes to ourselves. How we think about ourselves. Are we thinking in a predatory way? Or are we thinking in a human way? 
I have to think about that all the time. And it doesn't make it easier. <laughs> it doesn't make it easier even knowing that. But we've all inherited predatory behavior. It's, it's baked into the cake of our existence, our shared reality. Because we're sharing reality with predators. We're sharing reality with good people. We're sharing reality with giving people. We're all sharing a reality of all different types of people. And we're choosing what we're kind of dipping into. Sometimes it's different from minute to minute or it's different from chapter to chapter in our lives. Changes. But predatory behavior is, is very prevalent and it's rewarded. It's something that we think, I think some people that are even very, very... Uh, good intentioned after a while learn that sadly predatory behavior is what gets rewarded and so they'll give in to maybe that it's all about that messaging of what we're getting told works and what doesn't and how we're accepted and, and, and what makes us not accepted but when it comes to the industry it's just very upsetting because I agree with Ruby Moon in the sense where the conversations that need to be had aren't necessarily going to be had within the industry itself, I don't think, fully, because of how the industry is still in control of how far we are processing this information. They're still in control of the narrative. They're still the Wizard of Oz, so to speak. All about, like, lifting the... The veil. And that's what's cool about YouTube and cool about streamers and cool about independent media is that we're able now, our, our generation, millennials, we're starting to be able to take back the power. I don't, I don't want to say control, but it's about empowering ourselves to be able to speak with one another and actually start to be heard, our perspective versus... predatory behaviors perspective. Oh, I see Ruby. Sorry, I'm missing everything. Hopefully I'm making sense. Hopefully I'm making sense. Ruby Moon, acknowledging the cycle is important to stopping it. This unchecked behavior has allowed people like Colleen and Drake to doing things they didn't know weren't okay because society didn't show them it was wrong. I think it is very important that these things don't go unchecked. Where we are learning what it means to cycle break. What it means to break the cycle of ABUSC. And I'm learning. I mean, God, I am no fucking expert when it comes to the ins and outs of that. But something I have been learning is how quick... I think, oh my God, I'm thirsty. How quick we are to, and I have to check myself with this too. This is something I think we all do. It makes us human. Is we have to check ourselves if we are constantly calling out and, or, or, or calling in, you know, change. And I think... And this is not, this is not a, 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 this doesn't fit for everyone. So there's sometimes you need to call out. And then we also have to watch our language when it comes to calling out. Because sometimes it can have the opposite effect. And are we con continuing the cycle by how we're responding to the cycle? So, <laughs> this is the eclipse. <laughs> I'm blaming on the eclipse. But maybe it is the eclipse. But you know what I mean? You know, we also have to check how we're responding to the cycle. Are we responding to the cycle by contributing to the cycle? Or is our response to the cycle breaking the cycle too? Because it's so easy for us all day to go, this person, that person, Nickelodeon, this, that. We also have to, while we're doing that, because that is fucking super important, we also have to check in and go, okay... How am I contributing to cycle breaking? And it's, I think, one of the hardest balances. I think it's the, the balance that I have the hardest with time with most of the time. You know, like when we think of restorative justice and things like that. 
as a survivor, I have a hard time sometimes with that ideology and that concept. But we're just doing the best that we can, hopefully. And I think part of that is always making sure that we're, we're checking in with ourselves and making sure that we're not, we're not contributing per se to the cycle. And that goes to for everything. That goes for everything. Chris, have you heard what happened with Mark Summers? Wait, is Mark Summers the person who spoke out about quiet on set? I did. We can talk about that a little bit later. We can talk about that a little bit later. But you know, this is this these are the and we have to create space also and this is not talking about uh, uh, Ruby Moon's super chat. This is just kind of off of that is we also have to create space for us to be human. And being human is definitely not perfect. And this is not about Ruby Moon. We're not talking about someone who is like actively harm somebody. But we also have to allow ourselves to be human and to create space for that. And I think the internet, something that I've been having a very hard time with lately is once you're, especially when you're a public figure, everyone thinks they know you and kind of knows, even when I'm live, people think they you know, know me, know me. And be off of that, there actually I was, did anyone see Dream Scenario yet with Nicolas Cage? Has anyone seen, it was so good. Has anyone seen it? I highly, highly recommend it. It's really good. And I was honestly very impressed by the film. And it really kind of touches on our virtual existence now and how it's become this dream scenario and how we think we know things that we don't necessarily because we read a thread, right? Or we think we know someone because we follow them online. And then maybe we'll watch a YouTube video and we think we know them because we watch that YouTube video or something. And there, 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 there are these dream scenarios that we are giving into and, and making it a, a complete reality. And it, I just, it just makes me sad because that's something that's been bumming me out lately is just seeing how people are, are talking with one another online. I, I, I just, it really upsets me because it's one thing, you know, you have your, your, your feelings about something, you're advocating for things, you're, you're out there in the street, you're protesting, you're, you're, you're raising money for this, you're doing advocacy work. Once we're wasting time, I do believe that when we're, uh, when we're going into other people's spaces, and attacking them, that energy could be used towards the advocacy work. And divide and conquer, a predator's like MO, typical predator's MO is divide and conquer. And it works, honestly, every single time. But I got this advice a long time ago when I started doing this specific type of work. And it was, don't get distracted on like side battles because the side battles will drain your energy and also distract you from like the goal of what you're trying to create into existence. And what I see so many people doing out there, and this is not judgment, this is more ob observation. Because sometimes I get stuck into the side battles, to be honest with you. But something I notice observing is if we spent as much energy as we put into our, like, fighting with one another and the thing and trying to get everyone to be like, our side is right. If we put that much energy into being in the streets and, like, advocating, literally physically advocating and, and, and being focused on the mission at hand, I think we, we would literally have already changed the world by now. Maybe not completely, but I think we'd be a lot closer than getting focused on, on, this, on the side battles. Oh, bad animal gifted one membership. That's so sweet. It's a sad but true thing. And I want this community specifically, or all of us together, to remind each other constantly, like, let's stay focused on the goal. 
And, and the goal is ending predatory behavior. And that usually starts with education, like educating people and getting people to understand how predatory behavior is able to be rewarded and to, to prosper and not to face any type of accountability. So we, we start with, with that part of it. I think it's like, what is it, agitate, um, um, what is it, organize, agitate, I, I forgot what it is. Maybe someone in the chat can remind me. It's like agitate, uh, uh, organize, agitate, educate, organize, agitate, educate, organize. And maybe it's one flipped, but that's the three, that's the power of advocacy work is agitating, agitating, <laughs> and then educating, and then, but the organizing. And I think we have the hardest time as humans organizing because that means not dividing. And what we're so used to is division. We almost think division is natural because of how entrenched we are in that ideology. And I think it's generational just because we've been dealing with empires and governments for so long and monarchies that we think div division is, is almost second, second nature. It's, it's, it's nature. But if you look at nature itself, that's not how it works. Everything's like symbiotic and working together. Even when it looks like it isn't, it is. And humans get caught up in thinking, whoa, we know best. So, and it's like, eh, I don't know if that's going to be that. I think anything that is division is predatory. Maybe not all the time and I can be wrong and whatever. But what I've learned thus far is unity, community, that's why unity's in community, that's what changes the world. We do it together. We don't do it alone. We don't do it. And actually every time isolation happens, we lose the dream. We lose our imagination and how our imagination can, how we can share reality. We need to share reality. We need to stop going, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. It's the eclipse, I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God. Okay, so we're gonna watch Quiet on Set and uh, erase maybe everything I just said. But <laughs> because of the eclipse season, <laughs> Uh, oh, and it's Essay Awareness Month, and it was my birthday, and I actually really think it's kind of strange that my birthday falls always during Essay Awareness Month, and so let's just remember if there is a, maybe I'll do one stream with with a, a nonprofit, but it's always hard because it's so strange when you do the nonprofit donations through streams, then people also can be like, that, I don't, that charity is blah, 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 so it's always very hard to do, but we'll figure out something to do for this month for Essay uh, awareness month and I'll, I'll be thinking about that this month and if you guys have any type of suggestions please email us and I would love to hear your thoughts because let's not forget it is SA awareness month and it's important to not forget that and keep doing the work so here we go okay let's watch a little bit of quiet on set and I'm I'm thirsty yeah no go ahead which one? Oh, this one? Finn, the autumn. Hi, I started an IG project for Essay Awareness Month. Came forward with my story in hopes to reach plus make others feel seen. I made a spotlight survivor post on your birthday with an animated drawing I made of you. Oh my God, Finn, that's so sweet. Wait, can you email that to me? Can you please email that to me? I'll pull it up on my stream tomorrow. Please email that to me. That's so sweet. That is so sweet. Whoa, Drenched in Drama interviewed Mark's, um, was, is it Sumsers, Summers, or Summers? <laughs> like, every time I see his name, I'm like, what is his name? Is it Summers? What is his name? I'm curious about your interview. I'm very curious. Okay, so let's begin. Hopefully, am I muted on here? Or am I good? I think when I played it earlier, it wasn't showing, but I'm sure I'm not muted now. I just was like, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good.
Here with me now are a couple of faces you'll recognize from the series, Giovanni Samuels and Brian Hearn, two cast members who spent multiple seasons on All That in the early 2000s. Welcome to you both. I think the, the, the main point of us participating in this documentary was to make sure that this doesn't continue. Your former boss, Dan Schneider, posted a video defending himself. He also apologized for his actions. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare. <laughs> sorry, I can't. I have to laugh because him just going, I'm so sorry. Into the camera's like, call someone and apologize then, bro. Like, if you're so sorry, it's like telling this nobody camera. It's like me right now talking, but there's at least people here. But still, you know, he's saying it's like, bro, then call someone and stop calling people to have them support you. That's not. <laughs> he has the time to pick up the phone to get people to try to convince people to support him. But he can't apologize to the people. It's unbelievable. He's such a joke. <laughs> Come on, Dad. All right, all right. <laughs> Anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing, we went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Yeah. Period. The end. Right. And if I had known at the time, I would, I would have changed it on the spot. If he had known at the time, he would have changed it on the spot. Why are you both laughing? <laughs> <laughs> He definitely knew. He definitely knew it was wrong. He definitely knew it was wrong. Okay? He was a grown adult. He knew, in my opinion, he knew it wasn't okay. Which is why they're like, ah. I, it's annoying when someone says they didn't know when it, it was obvious. It was obvious. It was obvious. A thing about his interview as a whole is um, I just thought, I thought it was funny. <laughs> what did you think was funny about if it? I, if, I'm, if I could be candid, Dan was an actor before all of this. <laughs> and so I think that he brushed off some chops and um, gave us a nice performance. Where was all of this apologizing? <laughs> True when Jeanette McCurdy's book came out. Or when Angelique Bates had said something. Yeah, very publicly. Very publicly. And I just- And feel... also when I protested, I'm sorry. And also when I protested in 2022 and also spoke out about it in 2019 in an Instagram Live. I mean, I showed up to the building. It was everywhere it was in vanity fair it was in variety it was in rolling stone it was in every publication and dan didn't apologize then either so there's been now a lot of people who have come forward before the documentary but now the documentary is what because the industry is call is now calling him out so it, what, what he needs as a safe haven what he needs to exist in it's his safe haven his safe haven is calling him out so he's like no it's fine when the individuals do because they're not the safe haven they're the prey he's like eh, whatever to the prey exactly but this the safe havens that's what he needs that's who he's honestly, in my opinion, apologizing to. And do you see how he right away also wanted to scapegoat and blame the safe haven? Because predators are alleged predators, predators. They're aware of how the safe haven is enabling their behavior. That when Dan Schneider blame, says, oh, my boss above my boss above my boss, that's because he wants, he is aware of how he needs that boss, those bosses. That doesn't excuse the bosses from Dan Schneider's predatory behavior at all. It actually shows the safe haven and what's enabling someone like Dan Schneider to behave the way that they are. But Dan Schneider telling everyone how he had these bosses is letting us know how self-aware he is 
of the safe haven and how they were allowing his bad behavior. Because predators are self-aware. Okay. That what's an apology without accountability? Realistically, if you take the, the inappropriate jokes away, do you have a show anymore? If you take all the foot jokes, take all the face shots, all, the, all of that inappropriateness, is it just commercials then? The foot stuff was crazy. I never. He did not just go, do you even have a show without your inappropriate material? Such a great question. Does he? Does Dan Schneider have a show, have a script without his inappropriate behavior? That's for the world to decide. Most likely, no. Is it just commercials? Yeah. Like the foot stuff. Nobody likes the foot stuff. He thought the foot stuff was funny. You're like, I'm a paid actor. I'm going to execute on the foot stuff. (sighs) Yeah. And then you kind of look to your left. And everybody in the room, or at least the adults, are laughing. You go along with it. Dan had this to say about diversity. Diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you go back to the very first Nickelodeon show I ever made, that's very evident, as it is in the second one, and then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel, and every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. And he's like, and then he has Boogie here in this. You're like, dude, Dan. Dan. How Dan doesn't even know accountability, same goes for diversity and talking about it. You can clearly, clearly see that. So you were the only two black actors on all that, right? Yes. What do you think when he says that? My gripe with the way that question was answered is that the question itself was posed to him about us. Right. Right. It was about us. He said, oh, I, I, I... Jump started the careers of Keenan and Kel. So he, so they talked about us being overlooked, and then he overlooked us in his answer. Right. <laughs> what do you do with that? Have Have you guys spoken to Dan since? You know, recently in the last weeks. Yeah, I got a phone call. Oh, he reached out. What? A week before the documentary aired, mm. he asked. If <laughs> I-, I love. Mm. Like, right before the doc aired, Dan Schneider reaches out to Giovanni. You're like, this is so... Dan, if you have nothing to hide, like, for me, for example, like, when I see people talk, like, I have nothing to hide. Like, literally at all. When you have nothing to hide, you're like, let me sit down and, like, talk about the thing and and show the thing and... Dan had every opportunity to sit down during Quiet on Set and tell his side of the story. Side of the story. You get it. But he didn't. Because he wanted, like we were talking about earlier, is to control the narrative, not to share the narrative with how others were experiencing something. He wanted to control that narrative, and that's exactly what he did with Boogie. With his warped, warped mind. He could give a Dan quote warped. of support. <laughs> he didn't know that you were in the doc- He knew I was he in the doc- He knew I was in the documentary for a year, and he was like, oh, I, I, I love Gio. She's, she's great, she's nice, and great, she could tell my side and now i know why he didn't call me he knew he was like definitely not calling alexa (laughs) i don't know what i don't know what you want i don't know what possessed him so he asked you if you would give a a quote of support and what did he he say he he asked because i did come back to do henry danger Mm -hmm. which was some time later he was like you had a good time on set right right and you said I, I told him I was terrified of him. Was he surprised by that? I don't know. 
I said, you have the power to make people stars. And I was, I was intimidated by you. I wanted to do a good job. Hey. The children of the next generation, if our children should, should so decide one day to say, put me in front of the camera. Would you say yes? I, as dad today? Yeah. With my four-year-old and my ten-year, no. Uh, yeah, absolutely no, not. Yeah, see, every, but that's the thing to really acknowledge also about our parents. I'm talking about mine and theirs. There was no child star awareness during our childhood, and so now it's childhoods. Child stars are the ones who are informing people about what it was like and and the implications of the industry when you are a child. Because also the only way to understand it is to understand how it impacts your adulthood. And we've learned that with Judy Garland. There's so many past Hollywood child stars that we were like, oh my God, they were giving them P-I-L-L-S and the whole thing. Hollywood has been horrible to everyone in it for so long. Don't even get me started on how the grips are treated. One day the grip stock is gonna come out. I can't wait for that. One day, like it went about actors. Like this is how the privileged people in that scenario are being treated. Now imagine everyone who's behind the camera you know you have you have grip you have you have uh transportation you, and they're there 2 hours before you setting the whole fucking thing up and and then there there there's a whole thing and then PAs PAs just look like they're about to explode as they as they run around the studio or run around the set because of how their bosses are pressuring them and the whole thing I mean the entire set environment and I really hope that eventually it does scope out, zoom out into how everyone is treated on set. Because it's not just actors. It is everyone. And I've seen it for myself. I've seen it for myself how everyone's treated. PAs yelling at makeup, makeup's yelling at hair, hair's yelling at wardrobe, and everyone's just in a... It's a lot being on set, surprisingly. And it's not really necessarily a very family, you know, people say, oh, set life is family. Yeah, sure, it's like, but when you think about family, what kind of family <laughs> are we talking? Sometimes it's dysfunctional, sometimes it's a toxic family. It, it can vary. So I'm hoping that eventually that does broaden out and, and we're able to hear also how people behind the scenes are treated. Because I have seen some very inappropriate behavior for them as well, that I hope gets acknowledged eventually. Brian, in the series, we hear a really heartbreaking story of um, when you're told you're not going to be asked back. Yeah. And that day clearly had an impact on the relationship you had with your mom. Yeah. Oh, my God, his mom. The day that we were told. I, she's so cute. In that moment, he grew up and his body language showed it just show this man protruding out. And that's a man that didn't trust his mom anymore. It ruined us. And you can't get that, like the moment you can't get that. It sounds like you were trying to protect him and do the right thing, and it came at a tremendous cost. Can you yeah. explain that? Um, I wasn't looking for my son to be this great star, and that's my dependency. My dependency is raising a healthy child. I'm a Leo. I don't know if that makes a difference to any of you guys. I'm a lion, <laughs> right? I don't mind being in my cave and licking my nails, but I have nails. How bad was your relationship? I mean, I love that. I, I'm not a Leo. I'm a Leo rising, but I'm going to take that regardless. <laughs> it's an amazing, she's, she's hilarious. I feel so bad for her because this is true when it comes to the industry and how it divided, again, predatory behavior, divides the children with their parents. And to be honest, like that happened to so many children in the industry is the division that ended up happening with their parents.
parents, with their family. And that's the people that you first learn to trust in this world. And that can really amplify or, I mean, really honestly amplify already maybe issues that are happening in the family. That just adds a whole new layer onto it. And it's just so sad to, to witness. Okay, we'll continue. Obviously at 13. With my son? Yeah, how bad did it, it get? It was ruined. It wasn't. And for six months, I was really mad at my mom. No, it was all of his life. Yeah. All of, from 13 on. Yeah. And you again, had a rift between you. Yeah. He didn't trust me anymore. He was resentful. He ran away from home. Yeah. So what brought you back together? Can I answer that? Yeah. The documentary. How? Wow. It was a light bulb moment to go back in time and discover mm. as a mom that moment ruined us. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a clip. It's never been seen before. So heartbreaking that this documentary is what brought them back together. So the industry tore them apart and strangely brought them back together. But that's just so wild to think about, is it not? Wow. And I see all your highs in the chat. Hi, everyone. Wasn't that also the case uh, with um, Drake and his dad? Or, didn't, or did they get No, they get were back? already talking. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, they were already talking. But this is the actual doc itself, which is wild. Uh, another black actor who was uh, featured in the series, and I want to play that now. There was a, a, a scene we were doing, it was called The Literals, and every time I said spit it out, she would spit what was in her mouth, whether it was the water or whatever, like directly in my face. Everybody thought it was so funny. Ha ha ha. Everybody's laughing. Me, I did not find it funny. The third time, I was like, infuriated like I was so mad that the director hurried and put me on the side of the set and was like listen Raquel breathe in breathe out she's the star of the show oh there it is he said don't make too much of a problem there it is I'm gonna ask her not to spit in your face but you have to keep your cool Woo! why is that so disturbing to you Brian Talk about Amanda Bynes, right? Spitting. I, I obviously did not know that story. I haven't. I've only had one solid conversation with Raquel, but oh my God, that hit me really hard. She's to just be told you don't matter in that mo in that moment. You're being spit on, and it's like okay, this person matters more than you because she's yeah. a star. Take it. Yeah. Um, yeah there's but, a cultural difference too, yeah. right? We are culturally trained to take it. Mm. Yeah. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is an actor from All That who's coming forward for the first time. Shane Lyons, thank you for being here today. Thanks. Also, it's like you're having a, I'm sorry, but you're having a white girl spitting on a, like that, and then you're telling her to calm down, like, what? No. Because I know in the actual, because obviously this is kind of clipped a bit because we're trying to get this into a smaller piece because I'm doing obviously commentary on this as well. But they talk about that and, it, and it, you're just. You... <sighs> and this is why it kind of upsets me, too, because when in, in, in 2019, when I, you know, was going down memory lane of Zoe 101 and also Dan Schneider's other shows and just thinking about my set environment and it was like legit all white people just was makeup and I think there's even a, is it Giovanni who says that I'm trying to remember in the in the recap I think it's Giovanni that like counting like how many black people are on set and that means behind the camera as well and I remember, like, it, it, you know, make makeup all white people, <laughs> uh, DP, AD, all the actors. And then you have Chris Massey. 
And when I look back at that, it really is upsetting. It is. And it, it, it is unacceptable behavior. It's unacceptable behavior when you think about Dan saying diversity and saying, oh, because there's two, one. Oh, yeah, I, I, and now, Boogie, you're here. You're like, what is happening? That is the problem. That is the problem. Is especially when white people are like, let me tell you about diversity and how I control it. You're like, huh? Please go away. Please go away. It's my, my two cents on that, okay? It's my two cents on that. White people telling the world about diversity and how they control it. That's all I heard from Dan Schneider. Am I wrong? Oh, I put Okina and Kel. Wow. Telling yourself much, Dan? And then he's like, and you, you're interviewing me. You're like, whoa. And then you think about the situation that he's having him in, Boogie. You know, it's just freaks me out. I'm just being honest. <sighs> okay. Let's let's continue. I mean, you bet. You were on the set with Brian Peck. I was on the set with Brian Peck, yeah. It, was he as charming mm. as people would describe him? I mean, 100%. There were certainly some passes, you know. That he made on you. Yeah. Did you realize at the time that they were passes? No. When he asked me if I knew what was, I thought they were racket. What did he say? Some conversation was happening in the green room, and we get called to set, and Brian follows behind me, and I'm kind of alone in the green room set, and he sits next to me and goes, because previously in the conversation they were talking about, and I just didn't know what they were. And he goes, well, we know what it's all right, Shane. And I said, yeah, like record So he's talking about B-L-U-E-B-A-L-L-S, which doesn't exist, by the way. But back in the day, men loved to use that shit on people that said no. <laughs> that was like their, it's, it's physiological, it's psychological, it's physiological. You can't say no. I hurt when you say no. <laughs> <laughs> you know that you know you know that's coercion did no one teach you about coercion what that is it doesn't exist dude but i heard a lot when i was younger i heard about it a lot there was one time i was again at andrew caldwell's party i love bringing up andrew caldwell's party he's part of the lord now of this um lord sorry not the lord <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Oh, wait. <laughs> right when I said that, it was like the Lord, and then the Lord, the real Jesus Christ, got angry. <laughs> it's a blackout. Wait, I'm going to step aside. I'm back, right when I was talking about the Lord <laughs> and, and mistaking the Lord for Andrew Caldwell. The lore. Andrew Caldwell's parties are part of the lore. Sorry, we're, we're trying to focus me now. <laughs> Anyways, there was one time when I was, I think, I'm, am I a little bit out of, am I fine, guys? Okay, so, there was one time where I, so at Andrew Caldwell's party, here, I'll tell you a little bit about the parties. There was obviously uh, drinks there, right? And so all the guys were, now when I look back at it, that was part of the predatory behavior, our culture, you get it. And I'll never forget it. One time this guy, I won't go into his name, uh, you know, brought me into a room, whatever, making out, and then he asked me to do something. And I said, no. And then he was like, what? And I was like, no, I don't wanna do that. 
And then he literally was like, wow. <laughs> and he went outside and told everyone I gave him B-L-U-E-B-A-L-L-S to shame me for saying no. And to be honest with you, that is what I experienced all the time at parties. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that, that that was used as a tactic that men thought was acceptable behavior and for them to go, oh, this is, this is, how could you physically do this to me? You're torturing me. And that's how they would get away with the R word. And SA, the worst, the worst. And then you learn later that ain't even science. That's not even true. And it's sad how many people have been pressured into things because they thought they were harming and hurting someone else by saying no. Bleh. Red flag. Okay, let's continue. So, so Brian, so of course Brian Peck's talking about that, right? Not, not shocking. With a child. I'm a kid, 13, 14, you know, and as I think. Wait, what happened? Whoa, that was wild. Everything's like, no, we're overheated. And I think more broadly, when you have a cult of personality in any work environment, Did inevitably, we... you, you, it, it's ripe for toxicity. Dan said he had Wait, many, where was many layers above him. You know, he had a boss, and his boss had a boss, and his boss wait, wait, had a wait, boss. Wait, 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 wait. I feel like I missed... A 13-year-old boy, like, he had with me. There we go. Okay, let's go back. I just didn't know what they were. And he goes, well, we know what... It's all right, Shane. And I said, yeah, like racquetballs, right? I'm a kid, 13, 14, you know, and as I think back now, as, as, an, as an adult, as a 36-year-old, and I go, would I ever have a conversation with a 13-year-old boy like he had with me? Mm -hmm. It makes absolutely zero sense for a 13-year-old girl or 13 year anybody. It's your kids. Why are you talking like that? What would a protection for kids on the set, since you were on the set, that makes sense, that's, that's doable, that's enforceable, that could work? What does it look like? So updating the law, first and foremost, so that no individual who is a convicted child can ever get on a Hollywood set again. And currently, there's a loophole in the law that as long as there's a guardian or a parent omnipresent on the set, they don't have to hire people who go through a background check. And I think more... <clears throat> Something, yeah, what the fuck is this shit? Also, let's just remember really quickly, right? When it came to Drake Bell and uh, Brian Peck, and it came to the parents, and it came to the Amanda show. These were adults and everyone on set, and he was able to manipulate and broom not only Drake Bell, but also the people around Drake Bell, his parents, you know, everyone, manipulate everyone. Then, if they become a convicted SO, they're able to still work around children as long as there are adults there. There were adults around when it happened. And that's the problem. That's the problem. There should be no, they cannot work with children. They cannot. They cannot work with children ever again. You want to debate it? You're like, let me find out if he does it again. Do you want to find out if he does it again? Why? Because if you uh, lose on that bet, guess who gets harmed when you bet on this? something like this you want to bet on it bet on someone else's life i don't like that let's not bet on it let's just go that happened probably better for that not to happen again and so let's remove that person from children altogether and not 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 try to like test it and see what happens with children no oddly when you have a cult of personality 
in any work environment. Inevitably, you, you, it, it's ripe for toxicity. Dan said he had many, many layers above him. You know, he had a boss, and his boss had a boss, and his boss had a boss. Well, yeah, well, you know, it sounds like uh, the farmer that blames the tractor for the poor harvest, you know? It's like, <laughs> not, not me, man. I, you know, I, you, you shirk responsibility. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, you know, when you're, when you're not at a point in your life to take ownership of the mistakes you made, the first thing to do is to shift the blame to someone else. You know, I, I think the, the lessons that hopefully uh, the perpetrators uh, highlight in this film can, can, can learn, because that's ultimately what needs to happen is them learning and everyone else learning too. If they can't do that, then there's, there's, there's no chance of them actually growing or changing or evolving. I'm hoping that the impact sustains and it's not just a flash in the pan of the interest. Same. But there's real change that needs to occur real change and i'm hoping this is a first stepping stone for that same give them a round of applause <laughs> round of applause for everyone that sat down for episode five i thought it was great in the sense where it was nice to also see him add his perspective and and his own personal experience when it came to meeting knowing Brian Peck and how important it is for this to not just be a trend, like please don't trend our trauma in the sense where if you are going to be, if you're, if you care about this, let, let's do some work together. Let's like keep our eyes on it. Let's support people that were directly inflicted, that were directly harmed by this let's support you know Giovanni you know so incredible for them all to sit down and and speak truth to power that's really what I hope the takeaway is from the documentary because that's really what it is and that's also with the R. Kelly documentary there's been a lot of documentaries of us learning Wow, when we, tr when we speak truth to power, what happens? What can happen? And it makes Dan Schneider uh, write up, a <laughs> write up a, a, an accountability script and embarrass himself in front of the whole entire world. And the world really got to see what he actually valued. Oh, Finch Fish gifted one membership. Thank you so much power to survivors and stay united yes stay united because that is also so important in all of this is whenever i see survivors dividing and trying to tear down one another oh is that not the worst i personally find that to be the worst is when survivors tear down other survivors it is the worst it's like, okay, survivors can have not have disagreements with one another, but when survivors tear down one another in this climate where it's already so hard for survivors in general, when you're actively tearing them down, it is so sad. It is counter the movement. It is counter any type of, of uh, survivor survivor power. It's anti-survivor power. Whenever survivors are dividing and, and bringing each other down, it's the worst. Like, this is not, survivors don't need, so you don't need to be best friends with a survivor. You don't need to like a survivor. You just empower the survivor and that's it. <laughs> but tearing them down is just the worst. Is it not? Is it not? It's so anti-survivor power. It just really is. Okay, so now we're going to get into the Dan Schneider story. And so let's do a TW here. There it is, SH allegations. And I'm just going to be reading from her DM. And again, I got approval to share her story anonymously. And again, I wanna say for people who just joined, I said earlier in this episode, to please respect the anonymity of this individual. 
This person wants to remain anonymous. And so let's not go over and try to get this person to whatever. Let's just listen to what she has to say and, and do that. Michael Park, thank you so much. Oh, keep it up, thank you so much. I'm trying, I'm barely, I'm, I'm keeping it up. But thank, thank you, Michael, I appreciate that. Okay, so here we go, we can share my screen. Let's go into the story, TW, TW, TW. Oh, it's trigger warning. <laughs> Quiet's like, what does TW mean? Trigger warning. Okay, here we go. So I'm blocking this because this person wants to be anonymous, and so just to be extra conscious of that, I'm, I'm, I'm blocking what show it was. But I'm sure people will probably end up thinking what it is. Okay, I did an episode of Blank when I first moved to Los Angeles at 18. It's a scene where there are a bunch of us girls crammed in a car, and we get in a cat fight over a boy. It was so hot inside the car, and the other girls got out to take a break. Dan came up to me, crawled the best that he could into the car with a mini fan, and pointed it at me and says, I'm your personal fanboy. Can we all picture it for a second? Let's just, let's pause for a second. Let's just picture it. I really don't have patience for specifically powerful men cramming into tight spaces around female employees and hitting on them. Wall on set. Offset, too. That happens all the time. Remember the Me Too movement? Men just thinking they can do shit like that. Like get massages from their employees in front of the executives and then later on go, oh, the executives let me do that, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Been happening for far too long. Powerful men, specifically, and to be more specific, powerful white men. Not always, but a lot of the time. Getting financially rewarded and protected while they SH and SA their employees. People that are supposed to feel safe. And the power dynamic is so intense that you freeze when it's happening. So picturing Dan Schneider cramming into the back of a car with a little mini fan. Blech. And saying I'm your personal fanboy to an 18 year old girl makes me sick to my fucking stomach. What do you mean by that, Dan? The slap? It was just a joke, like the slap. It was just a joke, like the feet with bananas all over them. Or with like a toe stuck in a faucet. Or like B-O-O-B -O -O -B clips on a website for Drake and Josh or iCarly. These are all just jokes. No. Okay, let's continue. So Dan came up to me, crawled the best that he could into the car with a mini fan and pointed at me and says, I'm your personal fanboy." There was something in the way that he said it, oh, we all know, that gave me the creeps. And I just fake laughed and tried to mask. As I was well aware of his importance on the show, Sorry, I'm just triggered just because I just know what that means. Or you just, you're freaked out and you fake laugh. And, and girl, especially, I'm not trying to be gender specific here. I'm just speaking for myself. But as a girl growing up, like you're just taught to 
smile and not take up space and all these things. So it just triggered me. I was well aware of his importance on the show. I remember working for four days and there was some deal with the contract that I would only be paid for two of them. Oh, sound familiar? Hey, does this sound familiar? Wait, let me make it smaller so you all can see it perfectly. I remember working for four days and there was some deal with the contract that I would only be paid for two of them. Does this sound familiar to the doc? Which was shitty. But I had the most lines and I knew the other girls were being paid worse. One of which was a rehearsal, which they had kids from St. Jude come to watch while we waited for our scene. Me and the four other girls stood with the St. Jude kids and their guardian and watched the opening scene where the main cast came out. When the cast came down, this gets, here we go, so trigger warning. When the cast came down, they were dressed basically in pajamas and underwear, and I stood there with those kids and watched Dan flirt and S-M-A-C-K one of the girls right on her ass in front of all of us before they started the scene. The others saw it too. And we were mortified. I remember the women in costumes being terrified of something. And they took those Polaroids you guys spoke about. Remember when I would talk about the Polaroids? Oh, see, someone else remembers the Polaroids too, Dan. Why do they take so many Polaroids of us? Why? They said Dan had to approve. <laughs> she validated that. Sorry, it's just like really impact, like. <clears throat> the women who, the women also rushed and hit us when one of the girls on the cast came in for a fitting. And I remember it being a weird, toxic environment. They hit us and said not to talk while she was in there. I wonder who it was. I have a feeling about who it was. I remember her being rude and dismissive to the wardrobe department. It just seemed like a really weird environment, sort of lazy and unprofessional. And as I've gone in my career and worked more and more, I look back and it's so clear to me that was not a safe place for children or young women and I've never been on a set like that since. Look at this. Can we just go back up here for a second? When the cast came down, they were dressed basically in pajamas and underwear. And I stood there with those kids and watched Dan flirt and S-M-A-C-K one of the girls right on her ass in front of all of us before they started the scene. Who was that? And see, for the first time now, we have someone coming forward. Dan, I'm talking to you now. We can go full screen, yeah. We have someone coming forward now, sharing their story. Where your uh, on screen became off screen behind the scenes. And this was on a very well-known TV show of yours, Dan. Did you cram back there and said, I'll be your personal fanboy? Did you? To an 18-year-old girl? All the while making the slap? I, I'm really sorry. You're not sorry enough. How many more allegations are going to come out about you, dude? And then, allegedly, she said that also the rest of them saw you 
smacking a girl's ASS and having one of them work four days and only paying them two. Yeah, let's, uh, let's do a power to survivors chant for a second so that we can give some applause to, to the person who came forward. Power to survivors. I mean, that's just, like what? And see, this is the thing that I see a lot in the industry in general, is this whole, oh, this is a, this is a joke. This is a joke, this is a joke, this is a joke. If, if someone's making a certain type of joke over and over again, when do you go, where does this cross over into reality? Shouldn't this be a red flag about the person? Yes, I do think so. I think that it should be a red flag, that it is the responsibility of these networks, these institutions, that when they see this type of behavior being brought to their desk, over and over again, especially by one specific type of person that likes to call these types of things, crimes even, right? Jokes, things that they're brooming the audience members into laughing at, into thinking it's normal, hyper-normalizing predatory behavior. This is why I don't like the institutions. Because we've learned from Dan Schneider, what did he say? I have a boss that has a boss that has a boss that has a boss that said I could do this. Good. I'm glad you said that, Dan. Because that's the problem right there. Is that you have people above you that are letting you do something like this. And then those guys at the top are always the same fuckers, honestly. That love to say, I'm not held. Uh, this is not a liability for me. I had nothing to do with, th with this. I just aired it over and over again and greenlit it and looked at it and allowed it and promoted it. <clears throat> but then when push comes to shove, they're always the ones who are like, Oh, no, no, it was him, it was him, it was him. It was like the Spider-Man meme. It's always everyone else but the, the people that need to be held accountable. And so when I hear that story, what a brave person to come forward to me and also have me sharing this story. Because when we see someone like Dan Schneider creating content like the content that we saw, the slap, all of this. This should have been a red flag. Then we read Jeanette McCurdy's book, right? Touching her knee, allegedly. Having her drink, this, that. We're learning how these things cross over into reality. And that's why kind of from the beginning of what we were all talking about, imagination does connect with reality. And we must remember that because we must also remember predators have imaginations too that they're trying to create or put into reality, make a reality out of what they're imagining. And where do we take a stand on that? So power to survivors. We, we went long today. I think tomorrow I'll, I'll, we'll watch Chris Massey's interview with Raven. And we'll, we'll get into that because I feel like that will be so many pauses. And I, I want people to take a rest after this because this was some, you know, TW content. And just make sure you take care of yourself. Rest. Very important too. And then tomorrow we'll go into Chris Massey and we'll listen to 
the Raven interview. I just want to say thank you to all the members here and also anyone who just watched today. I really appreciate all of you. Dave, Ethan, thank you so much for being here. Power to Survivors. Hello, 1212. Dan loved doing a bit on Amanda's show where he had all the power and was the main boss and called the shots. Now acts like he had no power, right? So true. Hello, 1212. It's like he loved it when he could say, I have the power. You have to do X, Y, and Z. And then when he's being held accountable, I don't have any power. <laughs> So true. I love that. That was such a good one. I loved that. So, so true. Um, yeah, the Chris Massey interview is yikes. Ah, okay. Don't leave. Okay, so tomorrow I'll, I'll be in here. We'll go. We'll watch the Chris Massey thing together. I just want to say, though, thank you for everyone for being here. Oh, I do want to say also that we're going to be watching Leaving Neverland uh, on Friday. We're, we're beginning that members only. So for the dinner party up, we're going to be watching that together. So I just, if anyone does want to be part of the dinner party up, we'll be doing that on Friday. And we just finished Open Secret together. And that was honestly really empowering. And the community was so incredible. And I just really actually did enjoy being a part of the community watching that. And so that's coming up this Friday. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who was, who's been here throughout this episode, liking this video, sharing it with someone, uh, subscribing and turning your notifications on. This hasn't been an easy journey for me. So I just really appreciate all, any support, honestly. Really means a lot. So I appreciate all of you. Oh, someone, Moa, thank you for building this community. Moa, you're amazing. Moa is incredible. Moa is, and we're gonna be doing more episodes with Moa's uh, uh, Web of the Den. Moa is so talented, has been doing incredible investigative work and sharing it on Reddit. So incredible, Moa. M like, power to Moa. I'll see you all tomorrow, and thanks again for, for being here and supporting survivors. Power to survivors. Power to all of you. Bye, you guys. Did it? Got it. Eat Nickelodeon! Eat Nickelodeon!